Um, so, thank you for the invitation, and I'm learning a lot from everybody. I should say that I am uh, not somebody who was trained in dark matter, dark energy, or particle physics, or astronomy, or any of those things. So, I come uh, at this problem for, as like a quantum optics person, and uh, this is how. So, I'll, I'll talk mostly about how I think about these uh, things beyond standard model fields, just like any other boson fields, and uh, how can we, you know, search for them, All right? So um, Andy kind of gave the big problem picture. Um, I'll just follow up on it. About more than 95% of our universe is made of dark matter and dark energy, so stuff we don't understand and don't know about. But we know very well that it's over 95% of the universe, and uh, that's uh, from astrophysical surveys. So anything we know about dark matter and dark energy, for sure, has been uh, from looking outside. And uh, as we get better and bigger telescopes, we are going to learn more about what they are not, or, or all kinds of constraints that we do know about dark matter and dark energy. And another way of uh, kind of looking for mostly dark matter here has been what I call looking inside, which has been a wide variety of direct detection experiments. We assume there is very weak coupling between dark matter and normal matter, and uh, we look for this very weak coupling in uh, very sensitive experiments, and, and this is where quantum hydrology and quantum systems kind of come in. The one that I have mostly worked with have been optomechanical systems because they have really good force and acceleration sensitivity. And I like to think that it's also because they have a lot of mass. Um, because um, at the end of the day, when you look at, when you're searching for dark matter, you're never really searching for dark matter. You're searching for a signal that depends on the coupling between normal matter and dark matter. So if you have a lot of normal matter that's very well isolated, that you can read very well, that's gonna like improve your signal um, of the dark matter, normal matter coupling. And again, like standard caveats uh, here, but, but that's why they make really good sensors of uh, beyond standard model kind of physics, because they have mass, and a lot of mass, depending on uh, which one you pick. Um, so, uh, I, as like I said, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how uh, a quantum optics person like me thinks about dark matter and dark energy, how to use mechanical systems to look for dark matter and dark energy, and just um, more general and, and new and still forming thoughts about how to think about ultralight dark matter as a quantum optics person, where I hope to get the blessing of some of the theorists about some historical quantum optics -y things. Um, that I think are applicable to ultralight dark matter as well. Um, so, as Andy mentioned, 23% uh, of our universe is made up of dark matter. It's 85% of the mass in, uh, in our galaxy and most other galaxies. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's about 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube of dark matter, which is one proton per centimeter cube, or I like to think as 100 grams of dark matter in the volume of Earth. And, and the question is, nobody knows how that 100 grams is broken into. So it could be just the right sprinkle of black holes, as Andy was mentioning, primordial black holes. They are candidates. Or, or it could be some uh, ether-like substance, uh, the way I like to think about ultralight dark matter, where you have something that is um, like trillion times lighter than neutrino, and it's everywhere. Um, if it's 100 grams, then lighter than neutrino, then you basically have a signal that's on all the time. So this is, uh, uh, a lot of quantum systems have been looking for this um, continuous signal, and uh, these things are essentially resonant or not amplifiers of this continuous signal. If you have a mechanical system, you can also use them as single phonon detectors or recoil detectors. This is for particle-like dark matter, where you know it's like it's raining dark matter, and so you're looking for for something that's not forever, but it's kind of raining, drizzling, whatever you want to call it, dark matter. And then you can you know put them 
this is like the, the great things you can do as a theorist in PowerPoint, right? <laughs> because uh, <laughs> you can put down your mechanical system as part of a gravitational wave detector to look for more fancier candidates for dark matter. So yay for mechanical systems. I'll, I'll stick to um, the wave-like dark matter and a, and a typical model for such ultralight dark matter candidates has been you know, what if you have some galactic scale like Bose condensate like thing that's uh, that's there, there is, uh, and, and you're swimming in it. Like, how would you like to, wouldn't you like to know that that is the case? And how would you know that that is the case? So if there is something like this and you have a large occupation number, then you think of these fields more like waves instead of, you know, particles. And uh, <clears throat> so you have a narrow band signal there's a, sorry, I just discovered the laser pointer. Um, another wave. Uh, you have a, a wavy signal that has a frequency that's dependent on the mass, which we don't know for like over 20 plus orders of magnitude. You have an amplitude that depends on the local dark matter density, which is one proton or 100 grams. Um, and, you, and this uh, cosine is a cosine for a million oscillations or so before it phase flips. So you have a signal that's everywhere. And uh, the way to think about ultralight dark matter, or the way I started thinking about ultralight dark matter is uh, because I come from optics, I just think about it as if I was blind and somebody told me there is that particle called a photon. Right? So if you were blind and I told you there is this magical particle called a photon and there's so many of them all around you, they are swimming, you're swimming in it. So how would you convince yourself, how would you build detectors for photons? Right? There's two types of detectors that you can build for photons. One are the direct detection type detectors where photons act as real particles and they do something. So you have a photoelectric effect kind of uh, detector where you know, you have a photon that gets you a current and you measure the current and you just go, there was a photon because I saw this current. And uh, then there's the fancier ones like Coulomb law, right? So because there are photons, they can mediate forces between two charged objects and uh, therefore there was a particle called a photon. Now Coulomb's law experiment is gonna give you the same answer whether you do it at day or night. And so it doesn't depend on your local dark matter density or local photon density. Um, but uh, so, so these are these indirect detection type experiments where the dark matter density is not important, but they mediate these forces. So, so examples of both of these searches would be like a classic QCD axion heliscope experiment or pretty much every single direct detection experiment that you can think of here, what is important is um, you know how much dark matter there is around you, and uh, like all the EP violation experiments, the fifth force bounds that we see are um, examples of these indirect detection experiments. So, so in my head, as a theorist, I have to like categorize everything, think like that blind person, and uh, this is where I am. So, so if you, if you, so these are all um, a whole bunch of experiments looking for ultralight dark matter where you can, that, that photon style analogy works very well in, in all of these experiments. And I'll talk about just one of them, but you know, stuff, this kind of stuff works for all of this. And as you know, an optics person, I was like, oh my God, everybody who's looking for dark matter believes in at least two miracles. But in this specific case, the two miracles are, and like everybody believes in it and nobody quite like explicitly says it, is that all of dark matter, so this is 20 orders of magnitude and frequency, why should you build a detector here or here? Because you believe that all of dark matter is made up of exactly that one particle of that mass or frequency that you can measure or your detector can measure. And, uh, and, and you can think that like all of normal matter is not made up of things that have that one mass. So why should all of dark matter be made up of things that have one mass? But we all have to start somewhere and that's a good starting point. Uh, miracle two is that it couples non-gravitationally to normal standard model matter in exactly the way that your experiment can detect. And um, I think Winchime is the only one where miracle two is not assumed, but 
Yeah, that's, yeah so that's, that's I'm like at least two miracles I can think of more that are assumed. But but uh, but yeah, so um, so the only thing we know for sure dark matter couples to is is gravitational coupling, but it's super weak as Andy mentioned. So and also. I don't know how such dark matter would be made if it's just gravitational. So there is a good reason to believe that there is non-gravitational coupling, and they're very um, and and that's kind of what we look for. And then think about it, if you have something, you know, electron, proton, or neutrino, or much much lighter than neutrino, you are not going to see it gravitationally. Um, or at least I will never write a theory paper about it. Um, so. <laughs> So how do we detect for these couplings um, using mechanical systems? I'll talk about three things in dark matter. I'll talk about uh, looking for scalar or vector dark matter and a uh, little bit about some dark energy candidates. And this is, uh, so if dark matter is this scalar bosonic field, and uh, I am assured there will be Lagrangians about it in the next talk, so I won't talk about it. But uh, it's going to lead to modulations in, in fundamental constants. So every atom is kind of getting bigger and smaller. And a stick made up of many atoms is also getting bigger and smaller. So this effect is amplified in a macroscopic object. And it's further amplified if um, you have an acoustic resonance that's essentially at the frequency at which this stick will be breathing. And, uh, and that's kind of the effect that a lot of systems are, are going for. And so I got into this inspired by actually Andy's paper, and a lot of uh, people looked into it, where you're, you're trying to see how much um, a macroscopic object got bigger or smaller by usually in, in optical cavities or our gravitational wave detectors, and uh, I think there'll be a lot more about it in, in your talk, Eugenie. But, um, but what I noticed was this one detector, Origa, which has gone the deepest in this uh, parameter curve. So the x-axis is always the mass of dark matter, and the y-axis is how much it's coupling to normal matter, so in this specific case, mass of the electron. And you can take a very thin slice of this pi probe very, very weak couplings because of this resonant amplification. And I was like, oh, I know exactly what uh, this is doing. And I can think of many other mechanical systems that can also take tiny slices. And also, nothing is a single harmonic oscillator. So you can look at many modes of the same mechanical harmonic oscillator to take like lots of narrow band slices out of it. So that was essentially our, our paper, looking at a whole bunch of breathing mode resonators to kind of carve out um, part of this space. And then uh, we, we started to think about what if dark matter is not you know, a spin zero uh, boson, but a spin one boson. And then the coupling to normal matter would be slightly different. And you can have, um, so now it's more like a photon, you know, spin one. And, and it couples to charges, so, but it's not electrical charges. You can think about like baryon charge or baryon minus lepton number because these things are conserved. Um, and, uh, and so if you have two objects with different baryon numbers or baryon minus lepton numbers, then there'll be a force between them. And, uh, and they're just like sitting in this sea of dark matter, like dark photon, whatever you want to call it. Um, if they have different, um, actually, we learned it from your paper. <laughs> so, so, so you have different bear in minus left on number, you're going to have a differential force, actually differential acceleration, because the force depends on your, you know, the, how much charge there is on, on these masses. And then this effect, just like the previous effect, will also be amplified if you have, um, you know, this kind of motion um, is, is one of your resonances. Uh, and uh, and then you are your dark matter happens to be at the same uh, resonance as as your mechanical uh, system, and so we thought about uh, this uh, a differential accelerometer, um, which is um, you know a mirror, and uh, and a silicon nitride membrane, and kind of monitoring its displacement. And again, the idea is the same. You can start to slice off. Uh, little pieces of this pie using, uh, you know, centimeter scale um, devices. 
And then we thought a little bit more about this whole problem and realized you can use the same mechanical systems. Um, so a, a little cup of helium, basically. And uh, the even modes of this system would be susceptible to scalar dark matter. So they would have this breathing-like modes. And you can look for scalar dark matter using that. And uh, the helium plus the box it sits in, so in this specific case, it was stainless steel. Um, these, the stainless steel minus helium differential motion is accessible using um, the odd modes of, of your detector. So you can have the same mechanical system and the even modes of that mechanical system can be used to search for scalar dark matter using um, this um, very um, modulation of fundamental constants and vector dark matter using the minus L coupling. And that's a system being developed in John Davis's group in Alberta. And the cool thing about helium is that the speed of sound changes as you pressurize it so you can change the resonance frequency by pressure tuning. And so you can have something like a heliscope detector where you sit at a resonance and then you change the, you know, you pressurize helium, then you go to a different resonance, mechanical resonance, and you can do it without sacrificing the Q factor, which is what you would do in most other mechanical systems. So this is under development, and that's pretty much all the work in, in uh, ultralight dark matter detection. Now I want to talk a little bit about dark energy as well, because why not? And this is the thing about when you're not in the field, everything looks like, oh, I, I, can, I can see that. And then it's like, oh my god, this was really hard. Um, so 72% so of our universe is made up of this weird constant uh, energy density fluid with, with negative pressure. The weird thing is that if you have a box of dark energy and, and your box becomes twice as big, then there is twice as much dark energy because the energy density is fixed, not energy. So as the box gets bigger, there is more and more dark energy. So as the universe gets bigger, there is more and more dark energy in there. So we have been living in a dark energy dominated universe for only as long as the Earth has been around. So four or five billion years before that, it wasn't the case. And uh, and if you come from you know quantum optics, you're like, the, if you ha it's about boxes and then boxes are getting bigger, then maybe it's like a zero point energy kind of situation. I have more modes, I can add up more zero point energies. And, and you, you do that and you find an answer that is 120 orders of magnitude bigger than um, the observed value of, of the acceleration that you see, which like, I don't know what happened to that zero point energy, <laughs> but, uh, but th that's kind of like, it's one of the biggest problems. Um, and uh, and then you know so so we need some sort of a starting point to to you know try to to answer this question. It turns out that if you have a scalar field, self-interacting scalar field that at least has negative energy, that does not solve the 120 orders of magnitude problem because I'm adding one more field on top of you know of something that was already too big. But that's what's one more boson on top of everything else. But it does solve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it does solve the problem of, um, of the fact that we only now live in a dark energy dominated. Like it's not a cosmological constant. Like it can it can change as the the universe evolves. So there are some, and also <clears throat> I mean this kind of theories were um, developed for for inflation, which is another period of time where uh, the universe went um, uh, underwent an accelerated expansion. So there's very good reasons. To have uh, to think about dark energy in terms of quintessence fields, also it's like super beautiful, um, and and then you know coming from the way I come from, like I am just going to think of myself as being blind to this other bosonic fields because now I can play this trick with every boson I can think of, and uh, and so what would be you know the the direct detection experiment and you know there's nothing nobody talks about direct detection experiments in dark energy. Because it turns out that the dark energy density is something something keV per centimeter cube, so it's five orders of magnitude smaller than the dark matter energy density. <laughs> so there's a lot less energy as dark energy density as dark energy here on Earth, um, but uh, but it's 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 the same number everywhere in the universe as opposed to dark matter, which is concentrated in galaxies. And there's a lot more, lot of like 
space between galaxies. So that's why we still live in a dark energy dominated um, universe. So that's kind of like, there are no, um, so we you know it's, a, I can think about things to look for dark energy and like assume the same non-gravitational couplings and all that, but it's, it's kind of a pointless exercise because everything has to be like five orders of magnitude, square root five orders of magnitude um, better. However, remember the Coulomb law thing, it doesn't depend on how what the local dark uh, local energy density is. So you can still look for dark energy fields using this, um, you know, kind of like thinking about this boson is mediating forces between two balls in my lab. So that's the type of experiment you should build if you want to look for dark energy. And I was like, oh, I have lots of balls. <laughs> So, so, um, but then like, why haven't we thought about it? And thank you, Andy, for taking the punchline. Uh, so, so this is, a, um, if you have a force mediating particle, it will mediate forces between two masses of this kind of form. And that's what Andy talked about. And basically, uh, this type of stuff for quintessence fields, which would, uh, if you want a constant energy density over the scale of the universe, this is the mass you're talking about. So you have like very light fields that's going to mediate. The fifth force associated with that is uh, is going to be measurable for like Earth Moon distance or two balls in the lab, and nobody saw it. Um, and and so that is the end of <laughs> of uh, quintessence fields. However, one can come up with couplings that are uh, dependent on the local mass density. And in these cases, this field would be screened if you are talking about uh, two masses in the lab. However, if you're talking about two galaxies and there's not much mass between galaxies, so they can do what dark energy does, which is push galaxies away from each other on cosmic uh, length and you know, mass scales. But when you look for that scalar mediated force in, you know, on lab scales, you won't find it because it's heavily screened in the, in the presence of matter. So it's kind of like behaving like a, a like a, a massive boson. And, and because essentially the coupling or the mass of this boson is changing depending on its local environment, uh, the, such fields are known as chameleon fields. And one can look for them using exactly, you know, so, so I had a student, Joey, who calculated the chameleon mediated force between two spheres in the middle of a spherical vacuum chamber. And my big contribution is to think of, you know, mechanical systems that are spherical where all his approximations applied very well. And uh, what we find is, whether it's like levitated microspheres next to a, a levitated source mass or, or these torsion balance experiments, you can explore a big region of this chameleon space. Um, so far, um, it has mostly been ruled out by either atom interferometry, which when you read the papers, you find that an atom equals a femtometer size ball of nuclear uh, mass density. And, uh, and so it's, at some point things get really screened because you're talking about nuclear mass density. And, uh, and the, on the other end is, is this ear wash where you have like 10 centimeter feral plate like uh, capa uh, masses and, and one can think, and when I read these papers, I was like, oh, what? Uh, I was like, there's only, the, I can think of so many mechanical systems that are between these two and, and that's kind of what we did. And so that's that. And in the and and if I just keep thinking about these uh, you know bosons that I'm I'm blind to, uh, one has to kind of remember that these bosons are essentially much much weaker signal than their you know the light. Um, and so how do you look for for such things? And I always go back to the the Michelson Morley ether experiment. Like if you think of ultra like dark matter, you always like there is this ether permeating you, right? So our quintessence fields. And, uh, and the big difference, I mean, there are many differences between uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment and the gravitational wave uh, detection is how much the y-axis has changed in the 129 years. So as you, as you, you know, we, we have better and better precision, we can probe uh, things better, we, we get to reveal a lot of new physics. We didn't find the ether, but we found gravitational waves. 
And, and when you try to like get the y-axis down so much, we end up with um, you know, the standard quantum limit where quantum mechanics stands in the way, but it's uh, not a standard. We will hear like projection noise limit and all that. It's barely quantum comes from the fact that you have discrete systems and it's not a limit. You can use correlations to get around it. And, uh, and that has been looked at in, in a variety of dark matter experiments because we, it's a very weak signal. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I was just like, I need to not think classically because uh, I'm a quantum person. And also, I can't think in terms of Lagrangians because that's not how I was, how I was trained. So like, I got to see the, the quantum Hamiltonian of any dark matter talking to any detector. And I couldn't find it even for the QCD um, axion. So this is the, so we derived it. And this is the, the Hamiltonian for a QCD axion talking to a haloscope. And, and um, like a, a whole bunch of people would see it and be like, oh my, be just like my student here who was like, oh my God, this is, uh, this is an open quantum system. You have way too many modes. And that's what's going to happen when you quantize a bosonic field in a box as big as a galaxy that is very weakly coupled to your quantum system or classical system, doesn't matter, and you just dark matter, right? So very weak coupling, too many degrees of freedom in the bath. And also, third, um, your bath doesn't change much because of its interaction with your system. So it's the theorist open quantum system because all my approximations are super awesomely valid. Um, <laughs> And so, so that's, um, that's, that's where we were, and we were super happy about it, that like, this is the ultimate bath that you want to measure. And, uh, and the problem is that this is not a thermal bath. Because the thermal bath would be easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's like not fun. Um, you can, the diagonal components of your, your axion field are giving you information about different velocity distributions. So as our galaxy like kind of merged into other galaxies and as other galaxies merged into the Milky Way, all that information is stored in the diagonal elements of this uh, density matrix of whatever ultralight dark matter field you have. And the off diagonal density matrix have some interesting quantum coherence properties and how all this quantum coherence has been dying over cosmic time scales because that's how it works. Um, so how do I get access to the, this quantumness of, of my axion field? And, and everybody always likes to tell me about, oh, you have a very, very large occupation number bosonic field. You're not going to be able to get access to that density matrix. And, and I'm like, but you can get access to a lot of information, even for large occupation number bosonic fields. I mean, sunlight light, uh, bulb light, and laser light are all large occupation number bosonic fields. And yet Planck had to quantize light to explain sunlight. Right? So, so it depends on what quantum effect you're looking for and how you want to go about looking for it. And this is the intuition that I would say comes from quantum optics. Uh, we know how to look for quantum, uh, thanks to Roy Glauber, we know how to look for quantum coherences in, in you know, large occupation number bosonic fields. So, so I made my students read his paper in journal club. And, uh, and then we sat down and did the calculations. And this is what we found. So if you take an ultralight dark matter field and you have this nice like standard halo model kind of velocity distribution, and you look for G2, you're going to see stuff like this. And this is, so one of them is standard halo model, and the other one is one where long ago another galaxy merged into uh, ours and you have this Gaia sausage. Essentially, like you, you're going to see deviations in what is known as bunching in the optics community um, because, of, uh, so because of the merger and acquisition history of our galaxy. So how this G2 dies will tell you about your, um, you know, uh, your galaxy's um, recent history. Uh, and also, if you indeed are swimming in a galactic scale BEC, you should find G2 to be one. And because uh, that's how it is for every bosonic field, right? So, so uh, but in, in, interestingly, um, if, you, if we see something like this, 
That means dark matter does couple to normal matter. That means dark matter is not just talking to your detector, but every normal matter in the universe. That means that uh, that galactic scale BC has been like slowly decohering. And uh, and so they, you know, and in general, like every constant state is a mixed state. So, so it's going to be a minor deviation. It should be between one and two, basically, closer to one or closer to two, depending on how much um, things have been thermalizing. And uh, and so so that's pretty much all I I have to say. Um, I I think about all these um, beyond standard model dark matter dark energy fields, just like that girl who is suspiciously happy being blindfolded and irradiated, uh, as a friend pointed out. Um, and uh, I, because if you have a lot of mass that can be well isolated, you can use mechanical systems to look for dark matter and dark energy to kind of like think a little bit about what is the signal and why. Um, and also, uh, you know, they are all bosonic fields, so the old school quantum optics of bosonic fields applies and, and one can use that to design and model and design better detection uh, setups and not just that kind of um, you know lift the veil on on the astrophysics and cosmology of uh, ultralight dark matter fields as we have done with with light so with that I want to say thank you uh, but I guess I have one more slide uh, <laughs> often you know you I mean it's, I would like dark matter to be ultralight dark matter because I'm sitting here from Planck's larder to, you know, Molmer's uh, wave function Monte Carlo. I have thrown everything at it and I'm, I'm, I'm learning physics and it's, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, but, you know, you could say maybe they are not bosons, maybe they are fermions and good for you. Um, and then why should people build more and more experiments to look for these things? Because maybe there is no signal to measure because it's not where you are looking. And, and I just want to um, say to my experimental and, and experimentalist friends that you know, the Michelson-Morley experiment didn't find what they were looking for. This is the theory curve. This is their, their the, the solid line is their result. They, they didn't find this de, um, variation um, that they would have found if light was an ether. And we ha I would say we have a much richer theory of light. Um, because it was not that, that ether. So I hope that, that we, you know, even by not finding dark matter or dark energy, um, using whatever experiment you're looking for, we will still be finding something about what dark matter could be. And so thank you for listening. Thank you for not making me stop. And, uh, <laughs> and I also want to thank my brave students who have not uh, shied away from quantizing light in big boxes. <laughs> so I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah, where's Waldo? That I, was a good one. <laughs> I have a very daft question. I asked this previously as well, but I'll ask it again. Um, so we're told that dark matter is sort of most of our universe, and uh, is the assumption that in our solar system it's just a very small component such that it's not actually affecting us here and we have to... You sorry, know, sorry, can you repeat the question? So I've already, my yeah. question is, is, based on how much dark matter and dark energy that we're told makes up our entire universe... 95%. What, yeah, so what's the expectation in our solar system? So when, if we're setting up experiments to look for this stuff, is the assumption that there's not very much in our solar system and it's very hard to detect, or is it not... Is there, I, I just don't know what the distribution yeah, yeah, yeah. of this is. Yeah, yeah, so um, thank you. That, that, that is, uh, I also have a mic. Yeah, so, <laughs> that's a, so, so I, as I mentioned for dark matter, um, just the rotation curve and simulations based on rotation curves seem to suggest that this far away from the center of the Milky Way, you should have about 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube of dark matter. Um, again, the kind of simulation that suggests that don't have centimeter cube uh, precision, right? Because it's it's like galactic scale simulations. Um, so and so you could not have any dark matter in that centimeter cube that you're looking into, or you could have, you know. So 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 yeah, the the jury is. So it clearly doesn't fit their solar system, right? 
Um, otherwise, you would have seen it. That's why I say it's the theorist, like it's the bestest open quantum system. You're very weakly coupled to your bath. So, yeah. Yeah, really nice talk. So at, at the end, with, we were talking about measuring the G2 function. So yeah. what are you assuming about the coherence time, and how does you how does that depend on the model and that sort of thing? Uh, yeah, so so you see that thing died off. Um, it is uh, it is off the order of coherence time. Um, so it is the same coherence time as you know the, the 10 to the 6, and I think this was EV-ish. But uh, the the x-axis is tau over tau. See the coherence time because the it doesn't like it's normalized the coherence. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so this will work for like any mass. Um, the, the but we take into account that Maxwell Boltzmann like standard halo model. In the first case, we said that it's a diagonal density matrix, and uh, and for the second case, you have um, it's, it's a multi-mode coherent state with with similar kind of statistics, but you will always have that your G two will be one for a coherent state. So I actually had a question about the these uh, chameleon searches. Yeah. So you know, there's these um, sort of older searches with atom interferometers. You stick a piece of metal next to an atom interferometer. Yeah. And so, could you just comment on the how the mechanical system wins, or what's the trade-off there versus those um, So the trade-off is that they are screened because you're assuming a ball of nuclear matter density. So at some point, things get screened because nuclear matter density is a lot, is a very large density. Um, and and so when you have more dilute systems like uh, silica nano uh, microsphere, then you can win on on that. You'll have less screening. So you can, um, I think I have that here. Um, essentially, you can probe um, the better force sensitivity you have, um, the the lower like self interaction uh, ranges you can probe, and the bigger masses you have, the weaker. Um, chameleon normal matter coupling you can probe. So the atom interferometry ones uh, probe this. Um, this is kind of a strange. I don't know why they stick to. I'm um, sorry. I should. Uh, um, we can talk offline about it. I, I can. I can tell you more. Oh my God, this does not look nice. Um, anyway, so so the uh, you need big masses to probe very. Weak normal matter chameleon field couplings. There is no way out. So I, I so atom interferometry can probe regions that I would say have been ruled out by some BBM constraints and, and stuff. So so when you start to look at this and the naturalness corrections and stuff, you need a big mass with very small force sensitivity and yeah, you know which way to go from there. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I think. Screen, for screen scalar fields, whether it's dark energy or not, um, is a very cool, you know, um, way to. Yeah, mechanical systems would would be the way to look for it. All right. Nice. Any ah, sorry. Thanks. So, so just to understand the the open quantum system approach yeah, for yeah. ultralight dark matter. Yeah. So, so this is a presumably an infinitely large bath, but it's not white. It has yeah. So yeah. it's it's sort of colored. Yeah. Yeah, of course that too. So, so does the sort of the, the spectral structure reflect itself on the G two somehow? Or uh, was in the death of the the bunching thing happens on the same kind of time scale frequency scale. Yeah. So. So you're saying you can read that off yeah. from the G two? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a there's a lot of uh, and and you know I mean thank you. Uh, you got there's people here who have been doing this stuff for a lot longer than me, so I hope I have your blessing when I say this is an open quantum system. There are these subtleties because you have a colored bath and and yeah, so, and I haven't finished exploring them. Yeah, and it's also I, well, I was going to say it's also multi mode, but presumably Has the multiple modes are the different sort of colors, yeah. presumably. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Or are there other modes that are not just colors? Yeah, it has to be, it is multi-mode. When you quantize light and bosonic field in, in a galaxy or, or however big it is, like if you have your detector, which has a lot fewer degrees of freedom than your axion bosonic field. That's a lot of degrees of freedom there. And, and so you have a very large system, but you're right, like there is this, you know, it has, it has this frequency. Um, it, it's, it's not as easy as I would do for, for a thermal graph. Um, because of its um, node structure, but but the the ways to to extract that information, um, for it, it I, I need to like dig deeper. To there, there are subtle ways to extract it from from your quantum system, um, the bath correlations, and there like you guys can. But help but, but, but but the system that I'm sort of probing, which is coupled to the infinitely large bath, which has yeah. been traced yeah. over. Yeah. So I think of axion as the bath or any ultralight dark matter as the bath that any and every detector is sitting in. Yes, yeah, so, so, so presumably the dynamics of the detector is no more given by a Lindblad type equation, but it's a more... Why should it not be? Well, that's I would my say question. Like that so, is the Lindblad. So it is a Lindblad, yeah, because, but, but, but... You okay. know, yeah, large degrees of freedom, very, very weak okay. coupling, and that doesn't change. That's okay. the three things you assume for Lindblad. Okay, but you have... Because it's colored, you have sort of you many. You still have many modes. Many, yeah. many modes. Okay, I see. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Any last questions? Okay, let's thank Swati.